loud. Main screen turn on. I think this is it. Um, is everybody seeing the document with our agenda? I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it, yeah. All right. Did Okay, so Zoom did something weird. Did everybody see my email for a moment? Well, it, it was out of yeah, it was it was some kind of weird bandwidth thing. I all I saw was an extremely low res pixelated version of who knows what it was. Okay. Well, or, all right. Clarify. I think I should I oh, anyhow, everybody can see the agenda. Um cool. We have an agenda and it matches what our minutes will be. All right. Um let's Hope that this works. Um, I believe uh, everybody's seeing slide compartments and node underscore modules. Yes. All right. This is, I think, where I lost everyone. Um, so <laughs> uh, let's proceed to some definitions. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So in the context of, of the module loading compartment API, Resolve is a synchronous function that takes an import specifier and produces the corresponding full, uh, an import specifier and a referrer module specifier and produces the corresponding full module specifier. It's a synchronous function um, and it is different for the web, which is based off of URLs and, uh, and uh, a, a, a dialect Oh, an, an interpretation of Node.js modules where um, every package has a unique module identifier namespace and only can refer to things in that package. Um, that is not how Node works, but it is a valid interpretation that fits into the compartment model, which I'll describe. Um, a module specifier is the string referring to another module. These appear in many places uh, and APIs. Um, they come in multiple flavors. A full specifier is an, a valid key in any of the compartments module maps, sometimes called a cache key, sometimes called a, mo a memo key, um, whereas a partial specifier is anything that's not a full specifier. And, these, and so when you write an import statement, what you have there is potentially uh, a full or partial specifier. The resolve function transforms it uh, into a full specifier for the purposes of fetching and all the other things that are all the mechanisms behind uh, loading module, loading and executing modules. Um, the module referrer is the the module in is the ref, is the I, the full specifier of the module uh, surrounding an import statement. Um, and uh, to be clear. A module's text does not imply any particular full specifier for that text. Um, it must it must be interpreted in the context of its referrer and in the context of the resolve function of the compartment it's in. Um, and uh, uh, there are some details I won't go into on that, but it affects how XS interprets modules. Um, a relative specifier and an absolute specifier are different things. Um, uh, and, and I'll explain how they are orthogonal on the next slide. But a relative specifier is simply a Node.js convention um, that uh, for, where, where the, the, if the first path component is a dot or dot dot, um, and if any of the other, and any of the other components may be dot or dot dot, uh, that when resolved in a Node.js res resolution, get converted into, uh, that, that get erased, uh, some of which get erased. Um, and an absolute specifier is non-relative. And to be, go it, ahead. It, 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 uh, don't people do that on the web as well? Uh, they do, but on the web, relative and absolute have different meanings. Uh, on the web, rel uh, on the web, a relative URL does not have to start with dot. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's actually quite complicated. In Resolve, a uh, module mm -hmm. specifier, they actually blacklist other stuff. Yeah. 
Yes, in order in order to leave open the possibility of a reconciliation with Node. Did, yes. Did you specifically leave out bare specifier here uh, for terminology reasons? Yeah, yeah. There there are a num there are a number of things about the web resolution. Uh, uh, but I, I think the big takeaway here is that there are two very different logical uh, the two very different logical namespaces. In, and in one of them, relative, and in each of them, relative and absolute are are domain specific terms, um, and the compartment API does not know or care about them. Um, they are an effect of what resolve function you choose, um, what resolve and load functions you choose. Yeah, the key thing is that the ontology you're presenting is an ontology that that applies to all of these. I would uh, argue that the concept of bare specifier is also somewhat of a universal. Yeah, by coincidence, I would argue that bare specifiers are um, uh, that they are meaningful in both, and they happen to mean the same thing. But it is not what I'm proposing is that it is not the compartment API that is imposing this convention. Um, it, that 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 is an effect of coincidence between. Um, the implement uh, bet between the implied resolve and uh, and locate functions of those spaces, um, and uh, the compartment API does not deal in those details. Okay, um, may maybe we can find a time to discuss that further. I don't want to take things off track now. For sure. Um, yeah. Uh, to continue. Uh, I think I may uh, have, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, the low, uh, yeah, I, there, I have more to say on that topic, but I want to get through the glossary first. Um, the, so specifically about f behavior of compartments, a load hook uh, I define as a function that locates, meaning uh, taking, uh, locates, retrieves, parses, and analyzes the dependencies of a particular module and produces the module record for a particular module specifier. This is a lot of work, um, so let me get it, let me drill into this. Part uh, this is and this is implementation specific. The compartment API exposes a load hook, and it's the responsibility of the load hook to implement, locate, retrieve, parse, analyze. And those are not terms of our of the compartment API itself. Um, to locate. Uh, and, uh, and it's an asynchronous function. All of these phases are uh, may be asynchronous as far as the compartment API is concerned. Um, the locate method, uh, the locate method is responsible for, in the context of a particular compartment, taking a module specifier and finding the corresponding location of the text of that module. Um, and that may be on a file system. It may be, uh, it might be a URL. And that is all implementation specific. Um, so the backing store for modules is not a concern of the compartment API. It is a concern that is delegated to the constructor uh, of, of a compartment so that they can pass that behavior in as a load hook. And um, so locating um, can be just a synchronous logical operation depending on what your backing store is. If your backing store is a zip file, it's entirely in memory. Locate can be synchronous. Um, but it is free to be asynchronous, which is important because the web and node have behaviors for following redirects and canonicalizing the locations um, uh, that, that, are, that are captured underneath this, the, this external concern. Um, uh, and the analysis of dependencies is a utility that we provide, because, uh, uh, which I'll explain later. Um, the load function uh, is uh, loading in general is recursively inducing the load hook for a module and its transitive dependencies growing out the, the, the working set, if you will, uh, building, building out the internal maps of the compartment from module specifier to module record for a particular entry point and its transitive dependencies. Um, I, I, this is I, I think Go ahead. You, well, you, you feels like you glossed over some stuff there. Um, um, first of all, the, when, when he says, says load hook, mm -hmm. a hook is generally thought of as a, an application provided function to, to insert into some kind of infrastructure provided greater functionality. True. And, and 
that's kind of not what's going on here. And in the sense that you have, you're gonna have different, different ones of these for say, you know, uh, com, you know, com, different kinds of compartments or uh, bundling or packaging things or loading over the web or loading from a file or from a zip file or whatever. So there's gonna be variation there. Yes. But it's, it's provided by the implementation of whatever you're using. So it's kind of yes. weird to call it a hook. It's, it's provided, it's pro, it, when you create a compartment, you provide a load hook as a, as a um, optional parameter to the compartment. So okay. it, it is the case that user JavaScript, it, you know, this is the thing, compartments enable JavaScript code to act as host to other JavaScript code. Right, okay. So in that uh, sense, it, in that sense, it very does it does match the definition. Okay. Of, okay. For, for um, so 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 the the, the roles of the sort of the different different actors in the play was not clear. Um, and then the other thing was you talk about a map of module records. That's the map from the the um, module. What do you call the module specifier? Mm -hmm. And but you you had these various different species of specifiers that you you laid out on the prior slide. Um, yes. This map maps from any of those, or just from the absolute specifier, or the full specifiers, Strictly or full or, specifiers. All okay. of those maps are full are keyed on full specifiers. Okay. Okay. So that so that first definition of load hook, uh, the the, um, the where it ends with. Uh, for a module specifier uh, that could accurately be stated as uh, for a full module specifier? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes. Is, and is the, is, the, is the translation from a, 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 a something that is not a full specifier to a full specifier um, um, related to the implementation of the load hook in any way? No, um, it's uh, the resolve hook. Resolve. Is, that's that's the operation. I, that yeah, is. the resolve hook is uh, is consistent across the logical domain of module specifiers, and so for example, you would only need one such function for any compartment it, that you would use a single function for any compartment that's using nodes logic for resolution, for example, and a different one for every anything that's using web resolution. So mm -hmm. conceivably, this is a world with possibly a world with only two resolve hooks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see Peter just joined us. Uh, I think that uh, backing up one slide to recapitulate the, um, the glossary. Um, of course. Uh, yeah. Hello, Peter. How are you doing? Peter in the house. Yeah, uh, Peter, I saw, I, I, see, I saw your mute thing go off, but I couldn't hear any, anything, so you might have to. Let's see. No, that. not yet. You are oh. autumn. Oh, there we go. Good. Sorry, okay. these computers right. are hard. Um, yeah, sorry for being late. I thought I would uh, join and uh, listen in just to kind of catch up on things. So, awesome. Thank you. We're, we're very glad to have you here. We're going to bank. We've only done one slide so far. I'm going to recap the previous one. Uh, uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, that's what I thought. You click and it goes forward. It's <laughs> one forward, two steps back. Um, so, so begin. So this is a presentation about um, where we stand with uh, with the compartment API and all of the other CES APIs and where we need to go in order to reconcile and harden the, uh, and and write the specifications for these and then maybe converge some. Uh, bring bring some knowledge together from uh, all of the implementations and, and stir them into the pot. Um, the uh, so I'm going through a glossary of terms that was uh, is markedly absent last time I got through half of this presentation. So um, in order for the rest of this to make sense, um, resolve is a synchronous function that takes an import specifier and uh, and a uh, refer specifier to produce a full specifier, which I get into. Um, and the resolve function is a hook that you uh, that you can create a compartment with a module, a dynamically module loading compartment API. The, that that layer of the compartment API, should we get there, 
um, uh, needs uh, it would need the, the constructor to pass a, 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 a definition of the resolve function. Um, there are potentially there are there is an, an open-ended uh, an open-ended API, but in practice there will be one resolve function that is suitable for the logical uh, definition of of, of module re uh, specifier resolution in node modules and a, and a different one for the web. Um, uh, and, and because we have this hook, we may have the ability to reconcile those worlds under a single roof where you could have some compartments in the web world and some compartments in, uh, in the node world and they would be able to interact with each other. Um, a module specifier is a string that refers to another module simply. Um, it comes in many species. A full specifier is a valid cache key or memo key in uh, in a com in a single compartment and it's scoped to a single compartment um, for its internal bookkeeping of what modules it knows about um, by uh, by what things it's been asked to load what things it has uh, what things it has uh, successfully loaded and what things it has successfully begun to execute um, a full specifier um, is uh, is is a cache key. A partial specifier is anything else, uh, any anything that is not full, and uh, and the um, it, and an import specifier is a specifier as as it exists in the import statements of an ECMAScript module, um, and those can be partial or full. It is the duty of the resolve hook to turn partial identifier uh, partial specifiers into full specifiers logically, synchronously. Um, I, I note here, by the way, that the term resolve hook appears nowhere on this slide. Yeah, I, uh, this, this being a glossary, I tried to, uh, I, I tried in fits and starts to sometime to, 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 uh, to, to, to declare the concepts and hope to eventually associate them with the implementation and subsequent slides. I probably, given that I used load hook to disambiguate load in the next slide, I probably would go back and edit this to say, as you suggest, uh, resolve hook. Um, the, uh, the, uh, again, um, um, module refer is the full specifier of the text uh, that corresponds to the text of a module. The, the, the refer is not um, intrinsic to the text. It is, uh, the refer uh, requires the, uh, the, the uh, in order to know what the full specifier is for a module, um, it must be taken in the context of the resolve function and in a particular compartment. Um, uh, so it is possible for the text for the text of uh, a module to be um, uh, to to have different corresponding um, full specifiers in different compartments, um, which is a which is something that Modable's XS takes advantage of, or at least exposes the ability to do. Um, and importantly does because it, that is that is the necessary feature for some things that you need to do in that environment. Um, the uh, the module uh, is so so resolve resolve produces full specifiers given an import specifier and module refer. These are so partial and full are carefully named to not be absolute and relative because those are separate concerns that are not captured by the compartment API. Um, those are concerns that are delegated to a particular implementation of resolve. And it is uh, in, in the context of a particular resolve function, those functions are free to, th those, those terms, relative and absolute, are free to mean different things. This is important because a URL has a different meaning of re relative uh, than, uh, than a node module, a, a module specifier. In the node, in yeah. the context I, I of think that separations, I think that separation is really good. I'm, I'm glad you did that. Thank you. Um, that that the, to be clear, you is not me in this case. This is this is <laughs> this is the uh, the API I inherited from Bradley and and Mark when I when I got to Agoric, and I think that yes, they they did. Uh, I I saw when I arrived that they were wisely in the process of transitioning to this terminology, um, and uh, the relative specifier and absolute specifier in Node have very specific meanings that are not compatible with the web at large. Yeah, and just for the, to get the uh, history straight here, um, uh, uh, Sala and Michael Fick 
um, more than me. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. I'm glad that we got a, a full chain of <laughs> a full chain of credit down to the bottom. That's wonderful. <laughs> Sometimes these things get lost. <laughs> uh, so the uh, then the going on a load hook is a uh, is a, a an asynchronous function that uh, is uh, an optional an uh, an optional is is necessary for a compartment to do dynamic module loading. Um, and it is a, an option. So it is an optional constructor argument of the of a modular compartment API um, that uh, that is not named load hook. Importantly, to be clear, the glo the glossary is deliberately separate from the implementation. At the moment, it's called uh, import hook. But to, for clarity, it is a load hook. It is responsible for locating, retrieving, parsing, and analyzing the dependencies of a module record or module specifier. Importantly, the locate uh, part is uh, is is maybe asynchronous, which means that it is possible for the locate hook to deal with redirects and canonicalization of the module specifier to the corresponding module location. The module location is a domain that is a separate concern from the comp compartment API because it might be a file system, it might be the web, it might be a zip file. Um, and, uh, and the compartment API is sufficiently general to straddle those distinctions by not concerning itself with the, you know, the concern of location. Um, for, that, for that first bullet, just to recapitulate, uh, the, where it says module specifier at the end of that bullet, uh, that should read full module specifier. It's always specifically a full module specifier and it's fed into the load hook. Right. The load hook would never be called for a partial specifier. Uh, uh, Right. Um, load is load is a facility of the compartment API that I'm proposing that we add to the specification um, that recursively induces the load hook um, to obtain the entire working set of a, uh, of, a of the module system for a particular entry point. Um, and the entry point is 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 the the, the argument to import essentially equivalent to the argument to import. Um, it is a full uh, it is a full module specifier uh, pardon in the compartment API yes it must be a full module specifier uh, and this does all of the necessarily asynchronous portion of uh, of loading a module and it does not execute the module um, executing meaning actually evaluating the code of the module in the context of that compartment with its globals etc um, so it is possible given the presence of a load function for a compartment to be constructed solely for the purpose of inducing the load hook. And this is important because this is a necessary feature for building bundlers um, and, uh, uh, and, and tooling. Um, a static module record is an opaque object that captures the analysis of a module. That is to say, when you take, uh, when you take the text of a module in a particular location, um, and this is the point where location does become something that is meaningful to the compartment API. It gets revealed potentially as import meta URL and gets import uh, and gets revealed as the the location strings and error stacks. Um, the that you get a static module record. Uh, the static module record is an, uh, is is captures but does not expose methods for the behavior and analysis of uh, of the uh, of, of parsing a module before executing it, and it reveals what it imports, exports, re-exports, and uh, um, and then can be used to load that module. The only way to execute it is to return it from a load hook to the compartment API. Yeah, very, um, very, very crucially, the static module record provides no API for accessing the source, and is therefore consistent with a pre-compiled implementation where the source is not available. Yes, it's essentially, it, it is a spiritual equivalent to a function constructor um, in, in that it could, uh, but it does not actually expose the API of calling it. 
um, it, it just gives that behavior to uh, the, it, the, the compartment API takes that and then is able to execute it later. Um, uh, possibly, possibly in multiple compartments at different times, um, or not at all. It's, it's multiply instantiable, which makes it very different than the concept in the ECMA, the TC39 uh, ECMA 262 spec, the concept called a module record, uh, which starts off only with the static information and then is mutated into an instance and therefore cannot be multiply instantiated. Uh, this right. one is, is stays static, and the instance is completely different. Uh, this one can be multiply instantiated. And so the static module record is also very specific to ECMAScript modules, and it does support late binding. Um, and because late binding is a very uh, tightly coupled concern to the implementation of an engine, um, and that there is no, uh, uh, there is no. There is no standardizable behavior for late binding for the compartment API. So it, it omits that and leaves that entirely to the host to define. Um, so, which means that it is only suitable for ECMAScript modules. Um, a, uh, the, but in contrast, we do need to be able to support third party modules that are not ECMAScript modules. And for that purpose, we have. Uh, we're, we are going to propose the addition of a static module interface, if you will. Name is to be decided. I'm suggesting interface because it is uh, it is a shape of an object that the that the compartment would be able to use. Um, the, that object may explicitly on its surface declare what its imports, re-exports, and exports are in a way that it can be linked with each. With these such, such modules can be linked with each other and ESM. Um, and it would importantly did not would not have the facility for supporting late binding. Uh, and this is go ahead. I think you meant live binding. Pardon, live binding. Live binding. I I will try to get that straight in my head for the future. <laughs> and, and that, makes, yeah, that makes more sense. I was really confused for a minute there. Yeah, late um, binding is a different thing. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, 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 I'm, I'm unclear. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the spec is entirely clear, but I am unclear on uh, uh, parsing and early errors and when various things that are possibly wrong with the module might be uh, detected and reflected to whoever is attempting to do the import. And right. Um, fail. I'm also unclear about where this, the where 262 stands on this, but I can say that where the compartment API stands on this is that the static module record constructor, which we are proposing to provide as a global, um, uh, is it to make available in the global namespace tentatively, literally a global, um, uh, would throw an exception if the module is syntactically invalid which means that it, and, and because that function is intended to be uh, called, since that construct is intended to be called in the context of a load hook, um, it would cause a failure to load. I can, I can so, there's, a, there, there's a lot of, uh, I, can, I can help clarify what the ECMA 262 semantics are of what follows if a module fails to load. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a well thought out semantic. Okay. Uh, as, as, as long as it's well thought out, um, I, I'm confident I don't need to understand it this minute. I just want to make sure that it is on the radar of those who have to actually deal with this question. I, I, I think I need to hear this. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, yeah, so uh, historically we've tried to actually loosen the air conditions in ECMA 262 because <laughs> Node wanted to do some stuff that uh, required a uh, late module graph uh, resolution, basically. Um, currently as specified, since the module graph must link uh, as an early step, uh, early errors actually fire during the linking of the module graph uh, across the entire graph. Um, so you won't be able to evaluate any code uh, if anywhere in the module graph there is an early error. Um, 
in particular, there are a few edge cases here where if you have conflicts such as from exports star, which have duplicate names that collide, uh, you can also have linkage errors outside of your normal rules. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but these all happen before any evaluation can possibly occur. Uh, but, but is induced by an attempt to evaluate, not an attempt to load, right? Ooh. Uh, so this is up to the engine currently. Uh, you don't actually specify anything about the load mechanism uh, in ECMA 262 itself. For V8, uh, you would get errors at different points in time, actually. Um, and then you have to write your loader that it properly propagates the errors. Okay, yeah, this is this issue about when do linkage errors, as opposed to initialization errors, when do linkage errors happen is really interesting. Well, so I can I give a more concrete example. Um, let's say we have a module A and a dependency B. Um, you can actually start loading B before you have finished parsing A. And so at yeah. that point, you can have uh, early errors due to syntax or to linkage in B that propagates earlier than the load error in A. So the, uh, the, so the phase that here is called load are, is this where linkage, are linkage decisions among instances made during load? Uh, they would have to be. Okay. They have to be completed by load. Okay. So then, They're completed then, by the end of load, or by the end of load. Uh -huh. By the end of load, to be clear. That means that linkage errors would also have to occur by the end of load. They should be apparent in the outcome of the load. Is that true for all of them? Is that true for all classes of linkage and loading errors that they must be realized by the end of load? Um, I believe so. There is one special classification where you have hoistable declarations that can have side effects in a psych in a cyclic dependency due to how live bindings work. Not you can't have side effects during linking. That's side effects during initialization. Uh. Yes, that is correct. So that would be afterload. That is the only edge case I can really think of. Okay. Awesome. And, and this is totally that, that load does not cause initialization. Cool. The this is this is good, uh, because I if, if that's the case, then I see no need for any further complication of this API. If uh, if it were possible for an incoherent um, module graph survive load, which I can see being desirable. I, I have done that in a previous in implementation of a module system in order to um, gloss over certain common JS deficiencies with false and false positives and, neg and false negatives um, in heuristic static analysis, which which might be useful to propose. Um, but if that if that is a, if that's a feature where we want an, a potentially incoherent graph to survive load into uh, into the import execution phase, um, the initialization phase, uh, then we would need a way for the static module record to communicate forward that it was constructed, but with an error that should be later thrown, um, uh, if, if it were to be executed, which also doesn't actually require any change because that is. Uh, that is possible to capture in the behavior of initial initialization. So static, static module record is uh, independent of linkage. The same static module record yep. can link multiple ways, and therefore linkage errors have to be represented outside the static module record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we're in a good place. Thank you for the question, Chip. It was important. <laughs>
Ja, Gesundheit. <lacht> oh, sorry. <lacht> um, okay, so live binding is a uh, subjectively dubious feature of ECMAScript modules um, where uh, changes to an exported variable can be observed in the scope of an importer. Um, and this is, this is the interesting feature of ESM where uh, conceptually to the programmer, an imported and an exported variable um, exists in a, a chunk of shared scope between two, uh, two scopes. Um, so, so the perspective we're taking here is that uh, we're only ever going to, to try to support live bindings from ESM to ESM. Uh, and as we, uh, as other languages um, uh, and other forms of module come to play within the system through the static module interface, uh, that none of those will support live binding. And that fits with the precedent we've got. Uh, um, uh, WASM modules do not have live bindings. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the JSON modules that people are talking about do not have live bindings, obviously. Uh, and CommonJS has no live bindings. Um, so that's a little bit complicated. Uh, Node creates a facade around CommonJS that can have live uh, updates. We do this for the built-ins. There is a, um, what is it called? Sync all built-in modules on the module. Uh, module. <laughs> this, is, this is not a problem, um, or at least no, this describes a workaround. So even if uh, we don't directly support it, you can recreate live bindings by creating a, fa a facade around your modules and ensuring uh, that only the, fa the facade is reachable. So this is, that's an interesting, uh, this raises interesting questions because it, is, it has become recently possible in, in Node for um, named exports from CommonJS to be realized as named imports in ESM. Um, if, uh, so the, the, the money question is like whether live bindings are, are supported at all for uh, between CommonJS and ESM is if I were to uh, have to asynchronously in a future turn change uh, a property of the object exported, the exports of a common JS module, um, would a module that imports that, that property of that object by name realize the change in its scope? I would advocate that the answer be no. Uh, if, um, you know, if, we can, if the answer to that can be no, I would be very happy. Bradley, what uh, is the answer? It is no. Um, we actually tried to do this with the Node.js built-ins, but it caused problems due to getters and setters, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And so we actually ripped that out, and we had this utility method produced that will manually update all the live bindings whenever you call it. It mm -hmm. is not reactive. Perfect. So it's, it's worth noting, though, that um, the Synthet the, the synthetic module record in V8, uh, which is a type of module record that is separate to the, the standard source text module record, does support live binding updates. So it's a synthetic module API that supports updating live bindings through a, a callback function, which can uh, sort of update any of, of the exports. Well, that's interesting because that matches what the internal implementation is in the shim um, and does give us an opportunity to reveal that behavior if it does become necessary in another layer of the specification. The question is whether we want to pursue it. So could I, could I chime in quickly? Uh, it's important to um, contrast what, um, what a live binding in an ECMAScript module uh, is relative uh, to the fact, it, it's basically a top level declaration of a, of a, of a name that is imported. Uh, it's a one way um, and it, it's really not a, you know, observable here as in um, reflected as opposed to uh, you don't get like a, like a, a way to know when it changes. It just, it, it's a one way change that will happen. 
Um, when, when you try to compare this to how an export is on, uh, in a CommonJS context, as a, as a developer who's using CommonJS who understands what an exports object is, yeah, like um, um, there, there, there's, no, there's no parallel. Um, and I think it, it would be a big mistake to, to, you know, if you can emulate it, you will likely be um, um, making someone uh, unhappy, but you wouldn't be aware because they're following, um, you know, concepts of the JavaScript language and they're treating this as an object. So, um, so I think, yeah, um, maybe what we want to do is uh, introduce a, a contrasting binding um, that could allow um, for, for a different type of binding that, that you know, reflects a common JS object, um, you know, export. But I wonder if we need that in the future. Uh, you know, hopefully people are transitioning away from, from you know, um, I guess, legacy uh, modules that were there before the language had a module system. Yeah, I, think, I, I would like to see this group um, take the stance that um, uh, we just don't need to support um, anything like live bindings, uh, uh, except for this one case of ESM to ESM, uh, and that the simple module interface that uh, Chris will be presenting uh, is really going to be the the you know, the, the the limits that everything other than ESM has to fit within, which just supports exporting values, does not support exporting bindings. Uh, and then uh, if that runs into a problem, you know, then we can be dragged kicking and screaming into supporting something more expressive, but we would really rather not. I, I have a continuing point of confusion, as, as I have for various aspects of this, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm unclear on what the phrase changes to an exported variable even means. Yes, in, in ESM, it is possible to say export let x equal 10, for example, and then let her say x equal 20. Um, okay. And, so and we're not that, talking about, uh, um, we, we're, we're just talking about an assignment to a variable. We're not talking about redefining a symbol. That's or, right. We're talking about assignment to a variable that by virtue of importing and exporting is in a shared scope between two modules or many modules. Yeah. Got to read okay. The, very good. Thank to you. To read the imported variable um, uh, before and after the assignment, uh, the imported variable will always have the same value as the exported variable. So when the exported variables change, the imported variables change. And the model is that you've, what you've imported is simply a name for the same changeable location. Uh, what the shim does is, uh, is that it actually does it by uh, propagating changes, but the conceptual, but that's not observable. Uh, conceptually, you're all just sharing one location. Yeah, not observable and not standardizable because implementations are free to do an implementation of this that involves no change notification, no, no, no programmatic behavior. Yeah. Okay, um, very good, thank you. Yep, uh, okay, so once more with feeling, uh, we're almost through the glossary. <laughs> uh, to execute a module is uh, to, to run it from top to bottom, quote, scare quote, synchronously. The shim at the moment is synchronous but only because we haven't dealt with the last item on this, which is top level of weight, which we'll get to. Uh, import is an asynchronous function that loads asynchronously and then synchronously executes the module and its transitive dependencies in a particular well-defined semi-nom deterministic order uh, once you take top level of weight into account. Um, semi-nom deterministic, I like that. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, Bradley knows this better than I do uh, because I haven't gotten around to implementing it myself yet. But my impression is that there are pools of reason where things are deterministic and synchronous. Uh, if linkage between the modules and, and if there's a if there's a subset of the modules that are um, 
uh, that, that are not uh, that have no asynchrony among them, that they will be executed in a deterministic order. Um, and uh, um, but where there is a top level weight, it uh, it introduces a break in that uh, in in those among those pools. Um, yeah, this but is I'm not the place. best to explain it. Yeah, this is another place where there's a uh, very well thought out uh, ECMA 262 semantics of uh, what happens when there's errors during initialization. And the, the, the answer here is very different than the linkage errors. The linkage errors are, con are contagious across the entire graph. The initialization errors are bottom up uh, by um, uh, strongly connected components as the unit. So in other words, if there's, a, if there's an import cycle, uh, if anything in the import cycle errors, then the, the entire cycle is marked as erroneous. Um, uh, but that happens uh, bottom up by cycle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to be clear, import is a composite function of load and execute or initializer, however you wish to call it. I'm going to call it execute for the purposes of this presentation um, and maybe convinced to revise it. Uh, for future communication. Uh, uh, execute does not, as a name, appear anywhere in the APIs. You only get load. If my, if my proposal goes through, you will have load and you will have import, which closes over load and execute. Um, there is currently a, a, a dynamic import. Uh, dynamic import is, the, is a syntactic import uh, that's spiritually similar to eval in the context of a, of, of a module. Um, that uh, that induces the compartments import method effectively. Um, uh, a like load import only takes full specifiers. Mm. Yes, it only takes full specifiers. Um, the import now is a thing that is currently in our proposal, which I propose that we're going to need to strike. Um, and the reason being that it's, uh, that its interface is not observably different than import in the future once you take top level of weight into account. Um, uh, the, but import now is uh, effectively the execute API um, as currently proposed. Right. And because to... execute cannot succeed if it has not previously, uh, if, if the working set has not previously been loaded in its entirety, import now is obliged to throw an error if load has not completed. Uh, um, I'll, there's a, a distinction between import and dynamic import that's not captured here. Uh, dynamic import, uh, uh, the argument is a import specifier, not a full specifier. Uh, yes, yes. Because, right. Because dynamic import has a referrer. Yes. Um, so yeah, and then top level of weight uh, throws throws a wrench into all of this because it obliges the execute method to be asynchronous. Therefore, there is no uh, user perceivable difference in the API of import and import now, um, and uh, which is to say that import would be requ uh, th th there is some wiggle room here. There might be a reason to keep the distinction, but I don't like it. Um, but let me explain. Um, it is possible that the interf that the uh, so import returns a promise for a module namespace, right? Import mm -hmm. now returns presently is specified to return a namespace object directly. That could be retained in the cases where import now refers to a module that closes out over absolutely no top level awaits. Uh, but could conditionally return a promise for a namespace in the cases where it does. Uh, I, in general, am mm, not just skeptical, averse to functions that either return a promise or not. Okay. Um, so, so Peter, I very much like uh, feedback from you on this because the, the inclusion of import now originally came uh, for, uh, due to a request for model. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I'm not in a place to give detailed feedback on this today, but, um, but we can take a look and, and get back to you. 
Yeah. Um, sorry. It's no. a it's a it's a it's a thicket, and I, I don't want to be too too uh, reactionary yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and we are uh, receptive to whatever uh, whatever you conclude. We're very interested in hearing what you conclude after having uh, some time to mull over it. Um, so uh, we are out of time, <laughs> and we've again, <laughs> again and uh, and. Uh, we have gone over absolutely none of the slides that existed a week ago, uh, which is fun. Uh, but I, I'll be sure to write more. <laughs> no. I think I it's, think fair to, it's fair to repeat the glossary before, before we get into it next, next week as well. <laughs> no, oh, <sorry>. no. <laughs> I thought this was very clarifying, at least, you know, um, I realized this was in, in part because it was in reaction to some of the things I was confused about last time. So I, I should hope it would be clarifying, but it was very clarifying. Yeah, good. Uh, it, and it was a valuable exercise in going through the process of clarifying because this all needs to be written down in a place where other people can find it. Yep. Yep. I think this was very much an hour well spent. I'm very glad we did this. All right. Uh, well, to be continued, I'll press the stop recording. Thank you.